Hi, everybody. It's such a pleasure and honor to have Sue Coppersmith with us today to launch us into uh, the May edition of Living Histories. Without further ado, Sue, please tell us about Living a Great Many Histories. Oh, well, thank you. And um, uh, well, I want to thank you for coming and also, you know, thank, um, thank the group for the invitation. And, and then I was thinking about like, what, what do you want to hear about? And of course, um, when people ask you to talk about, when I, people ask me to talk about myself, I'm like, wow, what good taste they, they know um, what's really interesting. But then I realized that's not exactly the story. So I want to tell you a little bit about sort of my trajectory. But then I realized that probably the most useful thing I could do is just tell you things that would have made it easier if I had known them at the time. Uh, so it should be quick and I'm happy to, um, you know, we're gonna discuss later. And so that's what we're, we're gonna do. So um, I'm, I have to tell you about where I grew up. It's Johnstown, Pennsylvania. It's most famous for the Johnstown flood. Um, but it was uh, it was a, it's in Appalachia, and there are sort of two things: is the Johnson flood, and the other one is it's the third fastest shrinking city in the United States. And I actually have my high school yearbook; someone put it online, and that's me. Um, but then, you know, I don't want these people because it wasn't a very big high school either. Uh, I grew up actually, it, it, this is called Westmont behind the fabulous John, uh, what Johnstown incline plain. So this is Johnstown, but then I, I actually grew up in a suburb called Westmont. And it was sort of not in the middle of stuff. And so um, I think one of the things is understanding imposter syndrome a little bit, just coming from a place where, you know, you really felt out of it. And I realized it doesn't look so far out of it, but it it was so. So I was I was extremely fortunate that I um, was uh, I I got I was able to go to college at MIT and there I felt much more like um, uh, that it was I shouldn't say it a real place. And so I think through my career it was very important to me that I I had gone someplace that was really known academically. And if I did well there, then I was competitive as opposed to, well, you're smart for Johnstown, but it's Johnstown. Okay. Anyway, so here's my um, my story. And actually what I did um, is I realized that I have like a lot of stories and I did a, a an interview uh, with like much more of the story of like how I did my thesis at Bell Labs and sort of all the stuff there. So I'm going to put the link to that in the chat. All right. So that's what that is. It's just the here's a longer version of the story of all the different steps. But I've been really fortunate in being able to sample, to, to work at a lot of different places uh, with, that are, are really different. So I, I worked at Bell Labs back in the day when it was really one of the centers of Spanner physics. And I worked at a national lab and I worked at, I visited Princeton for a year as, as a University of Chicago and then Madison, uh, one private, one public university. And now I'm in Australia and, and, and that also is different and you know, happy to talk about any of that. Uh, intellectually, um, I started doing uh, statistical mechanics and that sort of morphed a little bit into some dynamics of um, uh, nonlinear dynamics. And that was my thesis. And sort of gradually I got more into non-equilibrium systems. So work on glasses on uh, what are called sliding charge density waves, flux lattices and superconductors. Uh, and, uh, and then when I moved to Chicago, I was more explicitly in complex systems. And that was really um, the, first, uh, the, the first time I really worked on something that was uh, biological physics. And uh, the, probably the best known work I did in biological physics is probably the work I did with Leo Kadenoff on, on Kaufman models. Uh, then I moved to Wisconsin. Again, that's a long story. Um, that one, the move was based on family reasons. And so I'm happy if you want to sort of talk about um, all the different choices you have to make if you're trying to optimize not just your work life, but, you know, all of the different constraints. 
Um, but there I got into biomineralization and, uh, and also quantum computing. And now mostly working on quantum computing because it's where, I shouldn't say it, but it's where the money is. So it is true right now, I'm do, doing mostly quantum computing. So how I got into all these things is really be by people. And so I'd say that's my number one message is, uh, I would say you have to be lucky with people, but um, I think you meet a lot of people and I was incredibly lucky with people. I could give again the whole time to any one of these people. I will mention, especially Leo and Poopa Gilbert, who are the people who, you know, sort of just because I knew them, then we ended up working on some biological problems. And um, it was a way to sort of not be overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of stuff that I didn't know is by, by, uh, by working with people and hopefully bringing some different viewpoints. That's more, I'll do that. Okay, so here's the advice. Uh, I think again, the big thing I found through my life is it's the figure out what you want, which is much more difficult than it sounds because I found people gave me a lot of advice about what I should want and what I did want wasn't always what I should want. And, and people are usually well-meaning, I think, but sometimes really coming from a place that's sufficiently different that it's indistinguishable from being like totally unhelpful. Um, so uh, again, I can tell you stories of not doing that. All right. Again, this point being that all the things I did that weren't so good, I tried to distill down to like what would have helped at the time. Uh, the 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 other one is that you know people will try to get you to do things, and you really have to understand what's in it for you because a lot of times people ask you to do things because it's less work for them. They're not thinking about you; they're thinking about them. And uh, you know, and so it's important not to get. Oh, you know, not to do just things that make other people's lives easier. But on the other hand, you know, sort of yelling, you know, I, I, I'm a yeller, but don't be a yeller. Okay. Um, but, you know, don't burn bridges and, you know, sort of figure out where they're coming from and try to respond in a way that is not threatening. And again, I didn't know this. I was probably 50 when I figured out that people who I thought were evil were actually clueless. And so, um, the world is not as much out to get you as it might seem. Again, I was quite old when I learned that one. And then the other one, of course, is that, you know, I, I, my whole career felt like, oh, nobody gives me credit. Every single person you meet feels exactly the same way. Okay. So that was, that was my summary of advice and it's under 10 minutes. And again, I'm here mostly to take questions. And again, if you want the story of my life, I, um, I, again, I, the thing I put in the chat is, you know, quite a long interview where I talked about like the various hurdles and the weaseling around. And that's why I was in so many places is that it wasn't so smooth, but, you know, I did have some sense of where I wanted to go. And so I was able to, you know, navigate out of some not so great situation. That's it. Thank you so much, Sue, for packing so much into such short few minutes. Um, floor is open. Uh, you all, if you have questions, just unmute and go for it. I'm happy to go first. Um, so, Sue, um, so, so much of what you talked about were trade-offs and how complex it was to figure out um, need versus want trade-off and uh, what works for others, et cetera. So, so I guess my the short version of my question is, did you find some principles in the trade-offs you made that you can share with us? Yeah. Well, there's only one that I actually have been able to follow. And that is when somebody asks you to do something, you say, I'll get back to you. Because your first reaction is to say yes, because you're so happy that they asked you, you know, oh, I, you know what I mean? It's, you know, oh, I, they, they thought of me, I'm so happy. But then you have to think about like what's actually involved in doing it, okay. And, and that you can't do on the spot because your first reaction is to say yes. And also it's, 
I was brought up to please people, whatever, all these social, all these social things that, you know, are well documented. And I'm very prone to that. So, so the trick is no matter what it is, say, oh, it sounds really interesting, but I'll have to get back to you. So that's the only piece of advice that I've been able to actually adopt. And I don't adopt it hundred percent, but I have to tell you that it has saved me from things that I didn't want to do. But again, I would have said yes, but I, you know, don't ever say yes on the spot. Okay. So that's uh, um, that, but, but I guess the other thing was just sort of people would do things and I would just say like, they're just mean and people are just, most people are not just mean. They don't, they don't get their jollies out of making you miserable. They're, they're just coming from a different place. And if you can figure out where they're coming from, it's, it's pretty helpful. Okay. Um, um, let me follow up on that very last point that you just made mm -hmm. uh, with in the light, in light of the fact that you were the first of your kind in so many spaces, um, would you please tell us a little bit about how that felt, how you overcame, etc.? Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing that I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty old, but you saw I'm the class of 1974 at Westmont Hilltop High School. And, um, and so when I went to Cornell, it was like the first year that there were a significant number of female uh, graduate students. There had been like one a year, and then there was a group of like five. And, it was actually pretty terrible. And again, if you, um, that's why I just put it in the chat because it's like a long story. And, um, uh, and, and again, a lot of it was like, what is me and what is them? And, you know, and, and so, so much is just being centered on like people give you feedback, usually unpleasant feedback, but, and like, where is it coming from and what can I learn from it? And, you know, even if they're just, totally sexist pigs and I did run into a few of those you know it's like is there some kernel of truth or should I just like assume that like you know again they have their own reasons for not being able to um be fair or open to uh uh you know female being competent um but can I still learn from that and that and again that was that was a super hard trade-off and uh that's where the people, you know, having people who, you know, who you connect with and who take you seriously, you know, that's super important because there are just a lot of people who at that time, it, it, you know, sort of the assumption was, the, you know, I was an idiot and I, I definitely felt that. And so, so I had to sort of figure out why am I doing this? Why am I, you know, why am I beating my head against the wall like this? <laughs> Good question can't tell you the answer. So um, I see a hand. Oh, go for it, please, Tim. Yes, hi, uh, Tim Bylash. I, I am a physician and a yeah. scientist. I do a lot of different things. I, congratulations, thank you for the gentle way you've gone through this. I sort of have a two part uh, question maybe mm -hmm. you could think about. Um, I've, I've had the experience being in medicine and being in physics, having different cultural experience. And uh, recently I've been trying to learn another language, Swedish, and I came upon an exercise and my body felt pain, literally with the exercise. It was just a general, it was just, you know, and sometimes I uh, describe doing physics as running a marathon. You know, most people, if they try to go out and run a marathon, they'll never try again. Um, but with conditioning, with training, with coaching, I think it becomes even pleasurable and actually something you can't avoid. So um, in that context, I just find uh, the mathematics of physics, especially unapproachable to almost every human being and even to other science specialties and other physicists. And, and so there's, there's this kind of a repulsion, you know, and superficiality. Um, do you have any thoughts how to to make this high energy, this high, you know, uh, I don't know what to call it, mathematics required to do probably what you do uh, in a cultural sense acceptable to other people? Well, that I think is a great question because to me, that's why I put up a lot of crap at some level is the thing is that you, the mathematics is so abstract and yet 
it describes the world, you know, in this really very, you know, quantitative, you, oh, we changed this thing and this other thing's gonna happen. And, and, and that, that's, it's, it's like this change of language and yet you're sort of seeing, you know, something really fundamental about the world and the fact that it's like this really precise description is what to me makes physics so compelling. You know, and and again, it's so hard to see because you know there's a lot of things. Oh well, well, you know, when you put your your foot down on the gas, then the car goes faster, right? You know, but but this idea that the, no, you can really sort of understand that you know totally quantitatively, and you can set up experiments where you know the math is real, and I, and mathematicians, the math is real anyway, right? You know that they love the math, but uh, but physics, I think, is sort of this you know, this, 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 uh, this connection between the, the math, which has its own, um, you know, has its own existence and, and yet these things that you see every day. So in some sense, if, I, if we could explain it, but then the way we do it is like, oh, let's teach you all the math. And then, you know, look, it works, right? But then you got to learn all the math first. So how to make that accessible, I think is, is an incredibly interesting and difficult question, but I think it's if really if I could extend for, it a little bit too. Yeah. I was I was having a workout. I hurt my knee today, and it made me yeah. think about pain. And mm -hmm. um, I almost see I'm a physician for oh, many many years. I almost yeah. see that people want to be lied to. Um, <laughs> you know, in a, in the sense that the the um, the physics is so precise, but on the other hand, you have to protect yourself for it. So thanks. Uh, okay. uh, so, sorry, Tim, this is a more complex question. Can I ask you to hold that thought until we are off recording? While I quickly take a question from Leela uh, Nasser, who has a raised hand and wrap this one for the recording. Thank you, Tim. Oh. Leela, over to you. Hi, sorry. Um, my name is Lila. I'm a third year undergraduate physics major at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, I, I'm sort of curious. So you began doing condensed matter research and then were able to do some research in biophysics. And yeah, I so for the last two years, I've been doing experimental cell biophysics. But recently this year, I've begun an immunoengineering research project. And in addition to that, a condensed matter experimental project. And I've been told in many times to <laughs> uh, pick one <laughs> and all the condensed matter people are pulling me towards condensed matter and all the biophysics people are like, please do physics loading systems. And I find both really interesting. And while I'm interested in cellular systems, I like the, the quantum aspect of it and how to use quantum systems to probe them. Yeah. I was just curious how you handled, I guess, such a diverse area and like oh, branching between the two. Okay. Um, Oh, okay. So how? Oh, I have more advice. I love. Yeah, I love giving advice. It's like I, 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 I hate how much I love giving advice. And I think one of the things is don't think of it as like your life, because every decision just seems like oh my god, my whole life. And if you just say, well, do I want to do this for the next year? Like, what do I want to do most now? And I mean, you know, and it's not like you want to do something that's completely. Um, uh, you know, can't lead anywhere, but, but this idea, if it's, if it's really interesting and you're learning stuff and it's really compelling, like something will come along, you don't know what it is, but, you know, just being open to the opportunity of, of getting into a new thing. And again, for me, it turned out a lot was like, just, you know, meeting people who I found were so interesting. And then they, you know, and then we would end up, they would tell us something, you know, tell me something exciting. And it would remind me of some other thing I knew. And then that was like the basis of, of, of getting into a new area. But I found at the beginning, I was like just so focused on my whole career that I was paralyzed. But if you just say, well, what, what do you want to do now? And, and again, not just as, is this the most interesting thing, but the people, the, you know, just the whole package. What do you, what, what is the thing when you wake up, you want to do and not worry too much about the long term? Because people do this, like, oh, you know, if you take a year off, will you fall off the track and all that stuff? And um, that was like a lot of, I really wanted to take my year in England. And I had a lot of advice of what a terrible idea that was, but it turned out it was a good thing for me. Um, because it helped me understand what it was I liked, 
So mm -hmm. did that answer your question? I mean, sorry no, to was, do this advice. Yeah. No, no, that okay. was that was very helpful because I, I also feel paralyzed a lot of the time and I'm not even in grad school yet. <laughs> and so yeah. the yeah. idea of even having to make the leap from like choosing grad school is like, oh, you need to have an idea going in and you have to specialize then. So pick one now stresses me out quite a lot. Yeah, and I don't no, like people, having to. People are constantly pushing you that way. And I think if you just say, oh, but this is fun for, you know, I, I wouldn't mind doing this for a year. This sounds really interesting to do now. That's carried me through like, you know, I've been, you know, 40, 40 years I've been doing this. You know, but again, not, but, a, you know, a few years at a time. But if I tell well, I'm going to do this for 40 years, I don't know what I would have done. I mean, it's just so scary. Like, what if I make the wrong choice? Well, you, well I made some terrible choices. But again, if, you know, then you, then you dig your way out, you know. Uh, thank, thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Leela. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, everybody. And um, on that very high note, let's uh, let's give Sue another hand and stop the recording.